Well, good morning. It's good to see you today. Hey, the year was 1938 on July 17th. And and here's how the story goes. There was a pilot by the name of Douglas Corrigan. And he affectionately became known as Wrong Way Corrigan. And here is why. Because on July 17th, 1938, he set out in his Curtis J1 Robin from Brooklyn's Floyd Field carrying The story says two chocolate bars, a box of fig bars, a quart of water, and a United States map with the route from New York to California marked out. See, Corrigan had spent three years trying to get permission to fly from New York to Dublin, Ireland, and he had been told he could not do it. There was still a lot of fear over Amelia Earhart's disappearance. And so there were no more flights across oceans happening in the United States at that time. So, but he was told instead he could fly from New York to California. And so on this day, he set out and he flew on the 17th of July into the haze on that morning and he disappeared. 28 hours later, on July 18th, he landed in Dublin. Now, there's been a lot of speculation and a lot of debate that swirled over the years about whether Corrigan intended to fly to Dublin all along or whether he really did go the wrong way. Now, according to his autobiography called That's My Story, he says his flight to Dublin was due to fog and a misread compass. So, and the rumors and speculation still swirl to this very day. Now, why in the world would we talk about that this morning? Here's what I was thinking about when I thought about this story. Where we left off a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Jason took us on part of Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 14 as he is traveling through these cities around the region of Galatia. You'll see on the map there, right? Follow the red line. As he follows that, remember we got a couple of weeks ago where he was in Iconium and Lystra and Derby, And if, and if you, we left him in Derby, but if you remember what happened to him before he got to Derby. Paul almost died. He was stoned and drugged outside the city and left for dead before the believers and the disciples gathered around him and prayed and and took him back into the city. And then he got up and we left him going to Derby. Now, what we're gonna see in our text today is what happens after we follow that red line on the map and we get to the blue line. Now, if you had been Paul and everything that had happened to this point in chapter 14 had happened to you, when it was time to leave Derby, do you think that you would follow the course of that blue line? Where did he go? He went back, right? I mean, we would say, is this, you know, not wrong way Corrigan, but is this wrong way Paul? Like, Paul, what are you doing? You almost died in that region. Why in the world are you going back? Because here's the crazy thing. You see where the journey started in Antioch, Syrian Antioch? That was where Paul was eventually going to end up. Now, I'm, I'm not a, you know, geography is not my strongest subject, but I think I can figure out that if I want to go from Derby to Antioch that is in Syria, the quickest route is not to go northwest, right? I mean, I could go south and just a little bit south and a little bit east, and I could get back to a, the place I was intending to go quicker and probably a lot safer considering the cities that I just left tried to kill me. So is this wrong way, Paul? that we're gonna see here today. I want you to think about that for a moment as we read our text this morning. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 14. Verse 21 is where we're gonna pick up. If you do not have a Bible, look in the pew right there in front of you. There is a copy of God's word there. You can use that this morning. In fact, you can take that with you and you can keep that Bible. We, if you don't have a Bible, we want you to have a Bible and we want you to read it. So take that as a gift from us to you and use it, write in it, mark in it, highlight in it, get into God's word. But we're gonna pick up Acts chapter 14 in verse 21. 
We left Paul and Barnabas getting to Derby, and now in verse 21, it says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Adaliah. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, God, as we open the pages of your word, we thank you for it. We thank you that, there, that the truth is there. God, that these are your words that have been breathed out by your spirit. God, so this morning, would you teach us what you would have for us to hear. May our ears and our hearts and our eyes be open to not only be hearers of your word, but God, as we leave this place today, to be doers of your word. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's just recap a few highlights of this story that we just read in verses 21 through 28, okay? So a few things happen that, we're, that I want you to make sure that you're paying attention to in this text. First of all, Paul and Barnabas get to Derby, right? And it says that they preach the gospel there, and it said they made many disciples in Derby. So most likely, what we, what we understand by even Luke using that word disciple there, because he has tended to use the word believer when Paul preaches and people put their faith in Jesus, he calls them believers. So when he uses the word, they made many disciples, we can, we can assume, and I think rightly so, that Paul probably spent a decent amount of time in Derby, right? Because he's there, he's, 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 he's pouring in to these believers there after he's preached the gospel in Derby. But when his time in Derby is complete, when he knows it's time to move on, he's got a choice to make. And we've already looked at that, right? We would think the logical choice, the safe choice, would have been to go ahead and head on south and get back to Syrian Antioch, where the church there had commissioned him and Barnabas. And he was headed back there to give a report of how this first missionary journey had gone. But that's not what Paul does. Paul and Barnabas, they head back. They retrace their steps. And so they go back to Lystra and Iconium and, and the Pisidian Antioch. And it says they strengthen the disciples. They go back to these churches, these newly formed churches, and they strengthen them. But they don't just strengthen them. It says they establish leaders. It says that they established elders in each of these local churches as they retrace their steps. And then it says, I love this little phrase there, that when they get back to Perga, it says they preach the gospel there. Perga is an interesting place. This is where John Mark left them. For whatever reason, he left Paul and Barnabas and deserted the missionary journey there in Perga. So I don't, we don't really know what happened in Perga initially, but we know that as they're retracing their steps, Luke wants us to understand that Paul went ahead and he was preaching the gospel there in Perga. Don't know if this was like unfinished business or what, but... He preaches the gospel in, per, in Perga and then says he makes his way back to, to the church there in, in, in Antioch, there in Syria, the sending church that sent him and Barnabas out. And it says when he got there, he gathered them together. He gathered the church together. They met to worship together and for Paul to give a report of what happened, what God did on, his, on their missionary journey and even this incredible news, right? And we've been following this thread through, through Acts is that the gospel is for everyone. And so Paul is highlighting that by saying that, listen guys, the gospel came to the Gentiles. They are believing, they are coming to faith. God is at work and he gives this report and the church celebrates this. And then it says that he stayed there no little time. So Paul is there for a time with this sending church, with these people that he had grown to love. He, it, 
Luke just wants us to know that he stays there. So when we look at this text, right, initially we might think wrong way Paul, but I think there's a much better title for this section of scripture. It's not wrong way Paul. I think a much better title for this is the beauty and the value of the local church. Why would I say that? Because in these verses, Paul puts his life on the line to strengthen these churches that he had gone and helped to start as he preached the gospel in each of these cities. He's following the example of Jesus, who as the bridegroom laid down his life for the bride, for the church. Paul valued the work that God had been doing in these cities that he went, he and Barnabas to visit. And Paul decided, I've got to go back. Right, Paul could have gone on, right? He could have gone on and said, hey, I've got to continue to evangelize. I've got to continue to take the gospel where the gospel has not been, right? There is work to do, right? I've got this message of hope found in Jesus Christ and I've got to go on, right? If I go back, I might die. And, and if I die, then who's going to continue to take the gospel forward? But Paul makes an interesting choice to go back. Because he loves the church. Now, if we had time, I would love to take you to systematic theology class. I know many of you are like, oh, man, I wish we had the time, right? You're dying, right, uh, to, to, go to, to go to seminary with me today. Huh. All right, I guess not. But anyway, we don't have time to do that today. But if we could, I would love for us to spend some time looking at the doctrine of the church. Because if we were to take time to do that and we were to pull out texts all through God's word of when scripture is talking about the church, we would see some incredible things about the church. Number one, we would see that it's valuable. Because it is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for his bride, for the church. So the church is valuable. It was purchased by the blood of the Son of God. The church is beautiful because Scripture calls the church his bride, the bride of Christ. And it says that his bride is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the church is beautiful. We would also see that the church is purposeful because it is how God intends for his kingdom to be advanced in the world. Church, do you hear that this morning? That First Baptist Church, Bernie, is part of God's purposeful, intentional plan for the gospel to go out and for the light of Jesus Christ to shine all around this world. So the church is purposeful. It means you have a purpose, right? As part of the body of Christ. But here's something else we would see. That the church is messy. Amen? It's okay to say it. We all know it. Amen? I mean, come on. Don't, don't be so serious with me here for a minute, right? Those of you who have been in, in church, right? In the local church. Those of you who have been here for several years. Right, in a local church. Not this church, right, but a local church, right? Is the church messy? Man, is the church, is it sometimes slow to get things done? Oh my goodness, do we sometimes have disagreements in the local church? Right, do we always get everything we like in the local church? No, we don't, right? The church is a messy place because the church is made up of sinful people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. People who are being conformed into the image of Jesus day by day as we do life together. You know what that equals? Messy. It's messy. But I want to tell you this morning, Man, there is a beauty to that mess. Because here's what happens in the local church with all of our warts and bruises and, and, and complexities and sometimes, you know, just dysfunction at times. Here's the thing. 
that as we commit to do life together under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the only thing that can be said about us when we see God working through the local church is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Right? Jesus gets the glory in the local church when the local church commits to doing it God's way. The local church is valuable. The local church is pers- purposeful to God's plan in the world. Tim Keller, who we just lost a couple of weeks ago, incredible pastor in New York City, uh, Redeemer Church, theologian, writer, uh, incredible man of God, he said it this way, the glory of God is available to you in the church in a way that it's not available to you anywhere else. I love this line. There is no more important means of discipleship than deep involvement in the life of the church. Read that with me one more time. Say it out loud with me, that line, that part that's underlined. Ready, let's say it together. There is no more important means of discipleship than deep involvement in the life of the church the church. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I want to propose to you this morning that Paul believed that. And that is why Paul went back to each of the cities where he had been along the way in this journey. I believe that's what our text highlights this morning is this beauty and value of the church in a really powerful way. And here's what we can see. We're gonna go back through these verses in detail for just a few minutes here. And here's what we can see in these verses, right, about the local church and what the local church helps us to do better than any other, any other thing can do. And this is the first thing we see, that the local church helps us. When we're committed and involved in the local church, the local church helps us to harmonize the urgency of the gospel and gospel maturity. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at, what it, look at what Paul does, right? He's got a choice to make here in verses 21 and 22. It's, but look at what it says. When he had preached the gospel, right? There's an urgency to the gospel. There are people who have not heard, who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. So Paul is preaching the gospel to that city. But then look at what he does. He doesn't just preach it and move on. It says he made many disciples, Guess what? You don't make many disciples with one sermon. You don't make disciples with one altar call. You make disciples by getting your hands dirty and getting into the mess and doing life with people. And so you see an urgency to the gospel in Paul's ministry, but you see that Paul valued maturity in the gospel, that these people who had received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior now are learning how to walk with him on a daily basis. But he doesn't just do that there in Derby. Now we see him going back. Now, you might say, well, Paul, you're an evangelist, right? You got a job to do, right? You may have just a few shots left, maybe just one shot, because you almost died before you got to Derby. So, Paul, if if things are not looking good for you, you're, you're weak physically, right? You've been beaten, right? You've been stoned, right? You, you may not have that many shots left. What are you going to do with the time you have left, right? You would think, well, then Paul's going to take the gospel to places who haven't heard it before. But that's not what Paul does. And this struck me as I read this text, is that what if Paul only had one shot left? What if his time was coming to an end? What would he do with it? I think this text shows us how much Paul valued the local church, how strategic he saw the local church, how valuable he saw the local church to be because when he maybe had little time left in his mind, he went back. He went back to the churches. He went back to strengthen those churches So you see, it's not urgency versus maturity in the gospel. It's both. 
We're called to both as the local church, to harmonize those, to see the balance that scripture gives to those two, that yes, we are called to go, but we're also called to make disciples, which requires time, which requires effort to make sure people are maturing in their faith. And the local church helps us to do both of those and to learn how to balance and harmonize those two things together. But that's not the only thing the local church helps us do that we see in this text. It also helps us to value the importance of some things, leadership, structure, accountability, and even submission. Look at what it says Paul does when he goes back to those churches that he helped to form there in Lystra and Iconium. It says he appointed elders for them. Right, it says in every church, right, with prayer and fasting, right, and he committed these leaders in these churches to the Lord, right? Lord, this is your church. These are your people. This is your bride, right? So I am trusting you that these people, I believe you have raised up to lead in these churches will lead well, but I'm gonna help establish them. And he doesn't just do that in one church. What does this text tell us? He does that in every church as he retraces his steps. Church, I know sometimes we may think, ah, we've got our leadership. Man, that can be tough, right? I mean, are there leaders in churches who have let us down? Are there pastors who have not been what you thought they were? Right, have you been hurt by just lay leadership in a church, right? Has the church caused you pain at times? Sure, I would say for every one of us, if you've been in church for any length of time, that's probably part of your story, that church can be hard at times. But hear me say this, that just because things can be tough does not mean that God means that there should be no structure and there should be no leadership, right, or accountability within a local church. It is good and it is right for a church to have structure and for it to have organization. Scripture, in fact, tells us it should. It even tells us what those roles should be and how they should function. I want you to look at what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at these verses with me right here as Peter is talking about what Paul has appointed in these churches, the elders. Look at Peter's instruction to the elders starting in verse 1. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. He says, elders, you should shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. All right, can you hear me? All right, I'll keep going. I can get loud. I think we're booting back on. I just saw it come back. All right, keep going. Here we go. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Now, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Because this is a beautiful text because it is highlighting our need as believers, our need for leadership. It is good for us to submit to leadership, we need it. Scripture calls us as the church a flock that needs a shepherd, right? Christ calls himself the good shepherd, right? He is the chief shepherd. We need the shepherd, right? Because we are a flock of sheep, just like the old hymn says, right? Come thou fount of every blessing, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to wonder, that is us. And so God has given us a structure within the local church where he raises up leaders, even though they're flawed, he works through flawed people to give structure and organization so that we learn how to submit to leadership within the church. What is that teaching us? How to submit to Jesus Christ as our true shepherd as our chief shepherd. But Paul gives in, or Peter gives in very detailed instructions about how those shepherds are to shepherd, how those elders are to lead, to do it willingly, right? To do it faithfully, 
So many different ways he tells us how to lead in these verses. But then he tells us, I love this in verse five. He says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. You want to to know one of the beautiful things about the messiness of a local church is that it teaches us how to submit to one another, how to lay aside sometimes my preferences for the good of the body, right? How to sometimes set aside my agenda for a greater purpose. It's good for us to do that because we tend to be selfish people, amen? I didn't get a real big amen there, but (laughs) I'm thinking you just were being quiet about it. We are. We need the local church. Does it get tough at times? Yes. Can it be frustrating at times? Oh my goodness, yes. There are times, man, we want to go. The the gospel demands urgency and we've got to go. Oh, but sometimes the structures in our church can be like, oh my goodness, it's going to take forever to get there. Guess what? Jesus is on the throne. This is his church. This is his bride. Paul, when he went back to these churches, he could have just said, hey guys, listen to me. I'm going to write and just tell you what to do, but, but I'm it. I'm all you need. That's not what Paul did, is it? He went back and established leaders in every local church because we need it. There's value in it. That's not all he did though. It says he embraced. I think this text shows us that he embraced true discipleship because Luke is so intentional to tell us that he went back to every city along the route of his first journey. I think in telling us where he went, that he was going back and retracing his steps, I think it's showing us the importance of discipleship because it requires personal investment. Hear me say this, church, true discipleship requires personal investment. Paul didn't just leave it for somebody else to do, right? He had preached the gospel and he could have said, all right, some of you other people, you, you take care of this, right? Help these people grow in their faith. No, Paul felt a responsibility to personally invest in these new believers. That's why he went back. Church discipleship requires that we invest in others, other believers. If you've been walking with Jesus for a season of time and you would consider yourself, you've matured in your faith and you are not pouring into someone else. I'll say this as lovingly as I can, but as directly as I can, you're not doing what God has called you to do. Because true discipleship requires personal investment. We need you to be pouring into other believers to help them mature in the gospel. You can always be pouring into someone else what God has poured into you. You may not think you have a lot lot to offer, but guess what? If you are saved, if you have been born again and you are walking with the Lord, you can share with someone else who is not as far along in their journey with Christ, what Christ has taught you. That's discipleship. Paul embraced that. He invested personally. He understood that it required time. Right? Discipleship is not a strategy to get things done fast. But it is the strategy for things to be done well. Discipleship, life on life, investing, helping each other grow and be conformed into the image of Jesus. It's what we are called to do as the church And it requires time. And some of us are not patient people. And so we don't always like that. We want instant discipleship. Those two words are mutually exclusive, right? It is an investment of time, but it also requires intentionality. Paul went back to each city. He didn't just go back to one city and then leave instructions. Okay, now you guys go back to the city and then when you get there, have them go back. No, he didn't lay out a strategy like that. He went back to each city. He was being very intentional to go back to these places. Remember we talked about just at the beginning in this text how he went to Perga and Luke points out that he preached the gospel there. I think that's just another example of Paul's heart for for discipling and making sure 
right? That, that people understand the gospel message and how, how to accept it and apply it to their life. Because maybe Paul was distracted. Maybe this whole situation with John Mark, maybe he was distracted by that and he didn't feel like he did as good of a job as he could have in Perga. So what happened? When he got back to Perga, he started over again, right? He started back and said, I'm gonna preach the gospel again because I wanna make sure that I'm planting these gospel seeds and that people have the opportunity to grow and to be discipled. Here's something else the local church allows us to do and helps us to do that we see in this passage, celebrate. It helps us to celebrate the stories of what God is doing. Right, once they got back, right, they pass through all the cities and they get back to Antioch. And what does Paul do immediately? He gathers the church together so he can tell them what God has done. Church, stories that make much of what God is doing are powerful stories. And when those stories get shared within the life of a local church, they don't just inspire us, right? We can go watch YouTube videos and be inspired by stories. But when there are stories of God's work that are told within the local church for us to celebrate what he is doing, they don't just inspire us, they galvanize us. As a body of believers, they make us strong because when you win, guess what? If I'm part of a local church with you, if you win, I win. Right, if you're struggling, guess what? I feel that and I struggle with you. And so I'm gonna come alongside you and help you in this season of life that you may be in. If you are rejoicing over something God is doing, I get to rejoice in that too. I get to share your burdens. I get to share in the victories that God is doing in and through you. Right, church, we have something here that is so special. We need to celebrate what God is doing because it just bonds us together like nothing else when we celebrate the power of the gospel at work in the local church and through the local church. And those stories do something else too. They help to sharpen our understanding of the gospel. We don't have time to unpack this a lot, but when it says, when Luke is really purposeful to say part of what Paul celebrated is that the gospel went to the Gentiles, right? That is helping to to, to help those believers understand the implications of the gospel in their lives, is that the gospel is for everybody. Church, when we celebrate the stories of what God is doing through the work of the gospel, it helps us understand the gospel better. And when we understand the gospel better, it gets into us in a deeper way and it ends up coming out of us in more powerful ways for us to shine the light of Jesus. We never get over the gospel. Right, And so when we hear stories of it, it allows the Holy Spirit to use it to continue to sharpen our understanding of what it is Christ has done in us through salvation and how he wants to use that to to help us shine the light of Jesus in more powerful ways. Stories are powerful and this is a place for us to celebrate those. But it also was a place for Paul to pursue authentic community. After he gathered the church together, it didn't say, all right, Time to get back to work, right? Let's get on with the second missionary journey, right? We've done our first one. Let's move on. Number two, right? Time is of the essence. And what's it say he did in verse 28? He remained no little time with the disciples. What does that tell us? Paul needed to be refreshed. Paul needed to be encouraged. Paul needed to be strengthened. Those believers there in Antioch needed to be strengthened and encouraged by Paul, but Paul needed to be encouraged by them. Paul had had a lot of victories and a lot of God's stories on that missionary journey, but he had a lot of scars as well. And guess what? The local church was a place where Paul could experience true community. He got to do life with those believers. And in doing life with them, they got to comfort him and encourage him and say, Paul, you can do this. You can keep going, right? I know this has been tough. And now you and Barnabas are even having some tension. But guess what? We love you and we're gonna support you, right? And, we're, and God's not done with you. Do we need that, church family? Do we need community? 
Do we need people that we're doing life with that will comfort us with the hope of Christ when we're struggling, when we're in a, in a season of despair or grief? Do we need the local church in a time of discouragement where we're not really sure what God's doing? Do we need the local church when maybe we're tempted to stray and wonder from what God has called us to do and be as followers of Jesus? Do we need the local church to come alongside us and say, hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't stray. The spirit of God that is within you will strengthen you to walk with him faithfully. We need each other in the church. And I love that Luke points out that Paul needed the church. Paul was not some kind of super Christian that could do it on his own. He needed to stay and be encouraged by the local believers. So, we've seen in depth now, right? We've gone verse by verse and, and seen what God is doing and how this really highlights the importance of the local church. But now, in the few minutes we have left, I want us to zoom out for just a minute. And I want us to look at this text from a big picture perspective. And I want us to look at how we apply it to our lives. What are we to do with this? This text, I think, gives us Paul's one word perspective of life, of everything about himself. Paul's, if we could boil Paul's perspective on things down to one word, it would be this word, gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? It is the power of God for salvation. Paul's life was consumed by the gospel and it was that perspective of the gospel that led Paul to do what he did and it also led Paul to value what he valued and one of those things is the local church. And it's from that perspective that Paul answered three questions as he went along in this text that I think are three questions that we need to answer this morning. It all centers around God using the local church to help us answer these, but it all also gets back to what unites us as the church, and that is the gospel of Jesus. Listen, I want you to see this. One of the questions Paul had to answer that we need to take a look at, who controls my plans? Paul had a choice to make in Derby, right? Paul could have been about his agenda and doing what he thought was best, but Paul submitted to the Lord because, he, because the gospel demanded that he go back and he helped those believers mature. Who was controlling Paul's plans and Paul's agenda? Who controls ours? Do we have rigid plans that are informed by our agenda? Or do we have flexible plans that are controlled by what God is doing in us and around us that dictate what we do and how, how we live our lives? Paul took the road less traveled to go back. He took the tougher route to go back the long way. But he did it because he knew that was what God had called him to do. He knew that the gospel would be advanced in greater ways if he went back and strengthened the church. Who's controlling our plans? How about people? How did Paul view people? Did he view people from the perspective of how can you serve me? How can you help me do what I wanna do? Or did he view people as how can I serve you? It was at great cost to himself that Paul risked his life to go back. Why did he do it? Because he valued people. He took his role, right, as a leader in the church to go back and invest in people. Even though it may not have been best for Paul, he knew it was best for them. Do we have that mentality? As we do life in the local church, are we thinking about how we can serve others more than how we can get served by others? The gospel demands it. The gospel demands it. And in the local church, we need to have that perspective. And the last question that I think Paul answers in this text is where is my place? 
Who controls my plans? How do I view people? And where is my place? I wanna throw up a map for you. I want you to see something here. Again, just review. The two cities that are highlighted there by a red box. Paul was in Derby at the beginning of this passage and he was going to Antioch. That was his final destination. Right, we've already seen that the much shorter route is to go down, right, south and east. But that's not what he did, and we saw that. But I want you to see something else that really, I've, I've been wrestling with this. I've been, I've been meditating on this right here. Look at the city that's between those two. What's important about Tarsus? Whose hometown Paul's. I thought this was incredible. Paul could have gone home after this incredibly tough journey before he went back to Antioch. He could have gone home. It was close. But guess what? Tarsus wasn't home. Philippians 3 verse 20, Paul counted himself because of the gospel a citizen of heaven right? Worldly things, human perspective did not tell Paul where his place was. It was the gospel that informed his understanding of where home was and where his place was. And so Paul went back. Paul could hold on to this life loosely with that perspective of my place is where God has called me because ultimately my place is heaven. And so I can live life on this earth in a way that maybe doesn't make sense from a human perspective, but it makes absolute sense from God's perspective. Because I'm headed home, I'm headed to heaven, I'm on that journey. And along the way, God can take me where he wants to. He can direct my plans however he wants to. He can use my life to serve people, right? And I don't have to worry about getting served because ultimately my, I'm in his hands. And I don't hold on to anything so tightly that it distracts me from letting my life be used by God. I've already mentioned him one time this morning, and that was to talk about Tim Keller. And on May 19th, Tim passed away after a battle with cancer. One of the last things he said before he passed away is that there's no downside in me leaving, not in the slightest. He had that same perspective Paul did, that this world is not my home. Right, And so this is an upgrade for me to go on to be with my Savior. I watched a video of a conversation. Uh, Tim, uh, John Piper was talking about uh, the last conversation he had with Tim Keller. And they were talking about this passage in Luke um, where, the, where these 70 that had been sent out by Jesus were coming back celebrating all the things that God had used them to do, to cast out these demons and all these things. And Jesus told them to rejoice, not in that the demons were subject to them, but that their names were written in heaven. And Tim Keller told John Piper, we are to be more thrilled that we are saved than that we're successful. And we're to take more delight in our Savior than in his service. You know, as I thought about that this morning, you know how we're able to do that? Because that goes against our very nature, right? We wanna be successful, <laughs> right? We're doers, we wanna get stuff done. It's the local church that helps us do that. It's this community of believers that helps us to have the right perspective on how to be transformed by the gospel in our everyday lives. And so we're gonna close our service. But as we do, as our musicians come and we get ready to sing a final song, here's, here's, what, I want, here's what I want you to think about this morning. What's your next step after this message today? You know, I can't tell you what that is, but I can pose the question. 
And I can pose the question this way, as we have been looking at the beauty and the value of the local church, what is your next step as it pertains to the local church? Right? Is, is the local church something that you are committed to? Right? Is this just part of your routine and your tradition is to attend a service or are you deeply committed to doing life with other believers and growing to look more like Jesus and being used as his body to shine the light of the gospel in this community, in this place so that others grow and so that those around the world can see the light of the gospel in and through us, right? Is this a casual thing for you? Or is your life rooted and centered in the local church? Paul's was, is yours. So what is, maybe your next step today is to evaluate how are you investing in the local church? Are you in a growth group? Are you in a group where you can, where you can be encouraged and, and challenged and, and held accountable, but also be cared for and lifted up, right? Or you just attend a service? Are you just filling a seat? Or are you using your gifts that God has given you through his spirit to equip this body for the work of ministry. As we stand in just a moment and sing, I invite you to respond. Maybe that response is to use these steps as a place to pray, maybe to make a commitment in a fresh way to be deeply committed to the body of Christ. Maybe it's right there in your seat. Maybe your next step is to visit a growth group. Maybe you were going home after this service. Maybe you need to go next door and try out a growth group this morning to get more deeply committed. Maybe you need to serve this body to help it be stronger in what God has called it to be. You do business with the Lord and be obedient to how he's leading you this morning. God, take this time and use it, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.